Father, we just want to thank you so very much for this day, the day in which we can honor you, the day in which we can be able to honor our fathers, which is what we need to do. We need to be thankful and also, as was mentioned before, for the spiritual fathers as well, those that would take new believers under their wings or young men or teenagers that don't have fathers and need to have an example for them and just to nurture them in your word, Lord, and in your love. And we just want to look into your word this morning. And as we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think it's been about, oh, I would guess maybe 40 years or so now. And uh, I just want to make an example of uh, the Simpsons and Bart Simpson. And I don't want you guys to think that I've ever watched that, because I really haven't. I just know about it. But um, I, I know with him that he's like the, the, the butt or the brunt of the jokes, and he's, uh, he's, he's belittled, and he's a buffoon, and he's a goof, you know. But that was coming also in the sitcoms, even in the late 70s and early 80s. And it's been many years now in which the uh, father has been uh, disrespected uh, within our culture, and there's a real lack of respect. Uh, and now that there are many that don't even have fathers uh, in the home. And so God's word tells us to give honor to whom honor is due. And honor is due to the fathers, and especially for the godly fathers that are seeking to protect their families in this godless world that we're living in now, especially in uh, USA, in California, uh, in the school system. And I know that that can be a real big challenge because I experienced that for myself um, quite some time ago, um, maybe more than 30 years ago, uh, in, the, in the 80s, uh, my uh, daughter, when she was very young, 10, 11 years old, uh, became rebellious because of a young man that she was in love with, or so she thought, and he was known as the boy from hell. Uh, that was his reputation, and uh, we did not want her around him, and we thought the school was being helpful and supportive to us, but we come to find out that they weren't, and that they took... Uh, their side against us, and other adults did at that time. So we experienced that for ourselves. And now I think about the fathers today uh, with the young children that are coming up. I think about my grandchildren. I think about what a challenge that that really is within the culture now. And my heart really goes out to Anthony uh, and the others that have children and uh, Pastor Marco. And uh, our prayers are with you, and our prayers need to be with you. In Genesis uh, Chapter 1, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God created the father, he created the mother, he created the children, he created the family. And the family has really been under attack, and especially now. The mothers are under attack, the fathers are under attack, and the children are under attack. And as believers... We need the love and compassion of the Father. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. And we need to uh, have what a friend in Jesus. All our sins and and needs that he would bear and to bring these things to him in prayer. So I want to begin this morning in Psalm 103, verse uh, 8 to 14. The Lord is compassionate and gracious slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Jesus said, after he was being asked by his disciples, show us the Father. And Jesus said, how long have I been with you? Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And several weeks back, uh, when we were looking in 2 Peter, in chapter 3, I was talking about the day of the Lord from the perspective of the wrath of the Lamb. So we see in both the New Testament and the Old Testament, we see the Father and the Son are one. And the Father is loving, and he always has been loving. He's been gracious. He has his grace in the time of the Old Testament. He has it now. But he's also a just God. So judgment will come. And in the end, when you see the judgment coming there, and the fire comes to the earth, 
The lamb is involved with that. That's Jesus. So they are one, and there's no God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament. So this morning I want to show uh, the Father here in the Old Testament where it's saying the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west. Now that goes on forever. And I really like that because I don't want to ever see my sins again. We see in the Hebrews, the 11th chapter, it's the faith chapter. It's talking about what the Lord did through the lives of the Old Testament saints. And all their mistakes were revealed to us in the Old Testament. We see where they went wrong. But in the New Testament, in chapter 11, that's all gone. You see only their faithfulness. And in all eternity, that's what God's going to remember about us. He's going to remember the faithfulness in our lives And unfortunately, as long as we're here and we don't have amnesia, we're going to be able to think about that junk in our lives that that the Lord has forgiven us for. Sometimes we can feel really lousy about that. Uh, As long as we're here, we're going to have that. But someday we won't even have that. And we will not remember those things ourselves. And I'm very much looking forward to that. And in verse 13, Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. And that's mentioned also in the Gospels concerning Jesus. He didn't need anybody to tell him about what was in man. He knew that, and he knew that their frame is but dust. He realizes that about us, and he's compassionate, and he's there to help us. And in John 3.16, For God the Father... So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him did not perish but have eternal life. I'd like to turn to Matthew now. Matthew 23 at verse 37, right at the very end of the chapter there. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we look forward to that day when the Lord will return. But God's heart is being revealed here. The Father's heart is broken over Israel. And hundreds of years passed before God's judgment finally came on his people, his people Israel. He was very much long-suffering. They asked for a king. Samuel was very disheartened and felt bad. He felt like he was rejected. But God said to him, Samuel, it's not you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me as their king over them. So God allowed, and then they had kings. King David was a very good king. So throughout their whole history, he was always shown as an example. He's a type of Christ, and he was held up as an example as the best king. And there were several good ones along the way. But unfortunately, there were many bad ones, And they led the people into their idolatry and into their sin. But that's what the people wanted. And I've heard it said many times before that the people will get the leaders that they deserve. And so God was very merciful. And that was the time of Samuel I just mentioned. But then after they had kings, he sent one prophet after another, after another, after another. And generations went by. And then it came up to the time of his judgment when they were brought away in captivity to Babylon. Then in his mercy and his love, he brings them back, and the city of Jerusalem is restored, and the wall is rebuilt, and then you have those that came back as prophets to minister to them once again, and they had a new chance, a new start. 
But then as time went on, it went bad again. And then at that time, God sent his own son. And there was a parable where Jesus was speaking about, uh, you know, the person who owned the vineyard, and then he put those in response to be responsible for it. And when he was adjusting to the religious leaders, that they were put in responsibility, but they had not kept that responsibility the way that God wanted it. It was going to be taken away from them. And that they stoned the prophets and did those things to all the prophets. And now he would send his own son, and they would do likewise to him. They would be jealous. They would be angry. And they would want to get rid of Jesus, and they did. But it was all for the good because it was in God's plan to bring salvation to all people of the world, not only his people, but to the Gentiles as well. That's the long suffering the Father had for his children. And in the Old Testament, God being mentioned as Father is only a few times. And that's because the relationship that was set up there is that God the Father in that respect was God the husband and Israel was the wife and his people at that time were considered to be his people. And then we see here in the New Testament the transition is being made to God the Father and it's over a hundred times in the New Testament that God the Father is spoken of as the Father. Um, Just uh, the other day my wife and I we're watching a movie that I really like, that, that we really like. We watched together, and it just turned out that I thought, well, this is really uh, appropriate uh, because it has to do with fathers. It has to do with what I'm thinking about uh, for teaching in this study, and that's uh, the movie Heidi. And uh, you may have seen that before. Uh, I would like to read the book, actually, and see what the book says. I, I've never had the book, but uh, the two versions of it that I know of is the one with Shirley Temple, which I'd always seen and I really liked. But if you can get a hold of it, you want to see it, we saw it online for free. So check it out. But the one that I really like was made in 1974 by the BBC, of all things, believe it or not. Uh, That will also show you how drastically the BBC has changed since then because in that one, the message of the gospel comes through very, very clearly. I mean, it's out there, the message of the gospel, because there's the grant, the the godly grandmother that teaches Heidi how to read so that she can read the Bible. And within that context, the gospel comes to Heidi and she's saved. Now, at the beginning, Heidi was taken by her aunt to go and live with her grandfather. And the grandfather was a hermit that was living away from the people in the mountains. And her grandfather came to love her. At first, he didn't want her. He didn't want anything to do with her. But as uh, time had passed, he came to really be in love with her his granddaughter, and the grandfather had been very angry and bitter towards God because of having lost his son. And the townspeople were against him, and he wanted absolutely nothing to do with them. And that's why he had gone up to live in the mountains to be uh, away from them. And then there's this really close bond between Heidi and her grandfather, and they come to really depend upon each other, and he really uh, loves her. But then what happens is now the aunt comes back sometimes later, and when the grandfather's not there, she steals Heidi to take her back to the city to make money off of her. And Heidi was then with a rich family because the father or the man of the family's daughter was sick and needed to have a companion for his daughter. And the sick girl's grandmother comes to visit, and this is when uh, she taught Heidi how to read so that she could be able to read the Bible. And within that situation, Heidi comes to understand the gospel message because of when she was reading the story of the prodigal son. And so she repents of her sin and gets saved. And this is all very, very clear. You'd be surprised. This is uh, with the BBC. Later, when she goes back to live with her grandfather, she shares the gospel with him. And he repents of his bitterness and his sin towards God and he is saved. And that, yeah, praise God, isn't it? And uh, that was out there for everybody to see at that time. I'm sure many did. Uh, and it's still on the internet. It's not banned. They didn't take it down yet. So it's, it's amazing. When I see things like that, I can't believe it's still out there. <laughs> you know? So I would like to turn now to Luke chapter 15. Now, 
Now, in the beginning here, we'll see the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And that each individual is precious in God the Father's sight. And he sent his only begotten son to die for the sins of each and every individual. If it was only me, Jesus would have come to die on the cross for my sins alone and for you as well. So it's good sometimes to think of that in as an individual way. And I have only in the last several years really come to think of it in that way because I was always thinking of his dying for the sins of the world and for all people, and I'm one of those people. But he would have died only for me if I was the only one. And you can see that right here in the beginning of this chapter. Now in verse 1, chapter 15, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives and eats with sinners. That would have been a legitimate complaint if Jesus was joining in with them in their sin, but he he was not. And so there's nothing wrong for us to answer someone at work, or to go wherever God sends us to go, to bring the gospel message. But we shouldn't go hang out in bars and be friends with the people there and then think God's going to work through that. There's a friendship evangelism thing that's going on now. We want to always have the church open for homosexuals or whoever they are to come in and to hear the gospel. But we aren't to receive them into fellowship and pretend like everything's all right. So this is often used by those who would do that and say that it's... uh, Justified because Jesus did this here. So in verse 3, So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? This is the heart of the shepherd. This is to be our heart also not only for the lost in the world, but also for our brothers and sisters that go astray. In uh, chapter 24, where I was just in Matthew, Jesus mentions four times about the day we're in at the close of the age that there would be deception and to not be deceived. And there is much, much deception going on. And our brothers and sisters are being deceived. They're going astray. They're living in sin. They're being taught by their evangelical pastors and evangelical churches that God accepts you that way. And so we need to be uh, like what we're instructed in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, to pray about ourselves. Lord, examine my heart and prepare me uh, so that when I'm going to go talk to them, I won't be talking about the same thing that's in my life, but help me and use me as an instrument to minister. And maybe through me, you can bring them back. Uh, to you. And there's a, a, an old hymn uh, that Johnny Cash did it's called The Lights Along the Shore. And I really love that because you're talking about us as a lighthouse along the shore so that there's a weary seaman that's going to be crashed and destroyed on the rocks. And he's using that kind of a picture and a story to be an example of us to our brothers and sisters to help them to avoid shipwreck. In verse 5, when he has found it, He lays it on his shoulders rejoicing, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine Righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus came to do the will of his Father, and that was to seek and save the lost on the behalf of his Father. And in verse 8, Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, 
there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus gave his life for each individual that is lost. The shepherd and the woman represents the heart of the father for the lost sinner. In verse 11, this here is commonly called the prodigal son as a story, as a parable. But I think that it also could be called the loving, gracious, and forgiving father. We could look at this from the perspective of the father as well. And not only the lost sinner, but the heart of the Father. And he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Now under the law, when there were two sons, the older son received two-thirds of the inheritance, and the younger son received one third. And then if the father was going to retire, he would divide the inheritance to his son before his death, and then it would automatically belong to his son after the death of the father. In verse 13, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. There he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now, within this cultural context, this guy has really become a complete a complete loser, because this was a job that was forbidden for a Jewish person. As it says in the law, cursed is the man that feeds swine. So in verse uh, 16, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. And when he comes to his senses, then he realizes what a fool that he has been. And he comes to a place of repentance. And there was no one there to bail him out of his consequences of his sin. And sometimes you need to really go down to your very bottom before you can be broken and, becoming, and be willing to be humbled in your heart and come to the Lord. Now, this isn't true for everybody, but there are some individuals that are just uh, so stubborn and so determined that the only way that's going to be able to happen as if they go down to their lowest of the low, and then they are going to repent. He found that he was, he found out that he was a fool for rebelling against his father. He found out that, the, and you know, people as they find out that they are in this position, will come to know the Lord in repentance. In uh, verse eighteen. Now, this is the gospel right here, right here. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Finding out that you're in sin and you don't even deserve to go to heaven you don't have a you don't have 
You don't deserve to have any relationship with God because you have lied. You have lived a life for yourself. And you beg for the mercy of the Father and you offer yourself to him as a bond slave. But then he adopts you and makes you his son or daughter. And he becomes your heavenly father. Now in verse 20, he's going to take action. First of all, he was repenting in his heart. He was humbled. He's determined he's going to do something, but now he goes through it with it. And in verse 20, so he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. In verse 21, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. Now think about this. The father's bringing the best robe. And this is like the robe of righteousness that we're giving by the Lord Jesus because as we see when we do the Lord's Supper that in his body he took our sins upon himself on the cross and paid the price for those sins. But then his blood is representing that he imputed to us his righteousness and the robes of righteousness represents that. In verse 24, For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. We were dead, and now we are alive. We were lost, but we have been found. Now, his older brother, his, uh, um, now his older son, was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began to plead, began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. Well, do you think he never neglected the command? Isn't that kind of like a person? That if you want to say, well, you know, have you ever lied? Have you ever, oh, no, 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 man, I, I'm a good person. You know, isn't it like that? Isn't that self-righteousness right there? Remember, we started out with the Pharisees and the way they're looking at things and thinking, wow, you know, he's hanging out with the sinners, that sort of thing. It's this self-righteousness that's there. And so this is coming out. This is being shown with uh, his brother, And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Now what is really, really a tricky thing is that um, I grew up in the church, so I experienced this for myself and I saw it myself. Because when I worked in the, uh, in the youth group, uh, the others that I was working together with were, uh, came to know the Lord older than, than I did. Uh, and they didn't grow up in church. So they were, I believe, in their early 20s. So their perspective was, wow, what an advantage that these young people have because they've grown up in church. They've, they've got everything. It's so wonderful. It's so great. And uh, I would think, well, yes, that's a good thing to grow up in church. But my experience was I came to Lord, know the Lord when I was nine, and I knew a young lady that had attempted suicide, 
and, and she didn't die. And then she repented of her sins and came to know the Lord. So I know that she knew the Lord and maybe one other. But other than that, uh, the others in my youth group did not know the Lord, and they weren't very nice to me, and they didn't exactly look up to those that, that knew the Lord. And there were a lot of things within the church to stumble a, a person, you know, a young believer. And then if you're brought to the church by your parents, and maybe if they do know the Lord but are not living godly lives within the home and you see stuff on the TV you shouldn't, or maybe they're church goers but they, they don't know the Lord, it could be not such a good thing. And I came uh, to know of such situations within our church by which the young people's home was not a good example. And so then I, I, I really felt deeply for them since that's the sort of experience where that I came from. Uh, and my background growing up, school, you know, and thinking, well, we're, we're, we're teaching these things out of the Word of God. But what are they to think when they're growing up seeing what they see and seeing the hypocrisy and so forth? So, so my heart really went out to them. So here you have the, the religious leaders, and here you have this young man. And they're re- representing at that time and for the last 2,000 years, those kind of persons that would grow up with, uh, like, the head knowledge, because remember, Jesus said, it, it, you're searching in the scriptures, but it's those that are speaking of me, and yet you want to you kill me. So for the last 2,000 years, there are those that, that have grown up in the church, or just say within our culture that used to be, be Judeo-Christian, and so people think that they're, they're good, and that they're going to go to heaven. And they don't have anything they need to repent of. Like, say, Donald Trump. He says, well, no, I don't have anything I need to repent of. What? what? I'm a great guy. I don't need to repent. So see, you have those persons that think that they're good. And what this always reminds me of is that um, on the very first night when I brought my, my wife to our church, and the very first time that she ever heard the gospel message, I'm so thankful that Mike McIntosh made it very clear that all the bad people and all the good people in the world all go to hell if they don't repent from their sins. There's going to be a lot of good people going there because there's so many people that need to know that. And that just really opened her eyes because she'd asked me questions as a, as a young person growing up in a pagan home. And her mom and others told her, oh, you're so good. And, and she got top citizenship in the schools, and she was quiet, and she shy, and she was really super good in that respect. So her mom said, oh, don't worry, you're going to go to heaven, you're, you're a good girl, you're such a good girl. So she really needed to hear that good girls don't go to heaven either and when they grow up and become young adults. You know, at the time they understand, they need to repent of their sins. Everyone needs to repent of their sin, and uh, this brother right here needs to realize he needs to repent of his sin. In verse 31, and the father, and he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. And as we saw at the beginning in all heaven rejoicing, this is the heart of the father to rejoice over every single one that has been lost and is found, but he wants to lose nothing as well and wants us on his behalf to be praying for and to reach out to those who are going astray, either living in sin or being deceived, our brothers and sisters in the Lord. In our world today, there are many children who don't have fathers in their home. And there are those that are uh, orphans as well. And God the Father has been a father to the fatherless. My wife and I uh, were both in a situation when we were uh, very young. She was only like uh, several months old, and I was two years old. And we were in that situation back uh, in 1962 a long time ago, that we didn't have a father, which was not a real common thing 
back then. And uh, at that time, Melinda's mom married someone that became her father, and then my mom married who became my dad and raised me up, and he raised me the same as his other children, and he treated me exactly the same as them. And I will always be thankful that he was willing to do that. He was very young and had just graduated out of the high school, I believe, like a year before, a year or two before. He's two years younger than my mom. And he came to San Diego to be in the Navy. And he chose to marry a, a, a woman that had a son already, which back at that time wouldn't have been a real uh, common thing. That was very gracious for him to do that, to, to marry someone uh, who had a child. And that was true also for my wife. So I want to speak now on the issue of God adopting us into his family as his children. In Romans chapter 8 at verse uh, 15 and 16. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And then also in Ephesians chapter 1 at verse 5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. It was just a few weeks ago when we were taking a walk that my wife was talking to me, and um, different people feel different ways uh, about being adopted. She was very thankful for her father, and so was I. But she grew up under very difficult circumstances within her family, and sometimes uh, when she was feeling really bad, and she'd just be at school and in the playground, she'd be imagining to herself that uh, her father had sent spies to keep an eye on her and watch out for her and make sure she's going to be okay uh, because she was in many precarious situations. And uh, then after she's come to know the Lord, she says, you know what? That's the way I was thinking as a little child. But God, my heavenly father, was always watching out for me. And I know she could have died on a number of occasions, but God, her loving Father, knew that she was going to become a child of his someday, and he was watching out for her. And I want to also look at something else about our loving Heavenly Father, and that's his discipline in our life that we need. And so I want to look in the 12th chapter of uh, Hebrews, uh, at verse number 4, where it's speaking about the Father's discipline. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. There is an aspect of God's love for his children that involves discipline. And God's dealing with us is for the purpose and the reason of correction. And the correction is for our benefit. Verse 7, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? I was very thankful for my dad. Now, he wasn't a believer. He didn't know the Lord. 
uh, and not till some time later when I was 12 years old. But he was very responsible in that when he got married, he said, okay, no more going to the bars, no more drinking, I'm going to take my family to church. So at least that was in this society back then, that even if you didn't know the Lord, you knew that if you're going to get married, you're going to be responsible and stop drinking and smoking and bring your wife and kids to church. And then not only that, but he was really very good and fair uh, at disciplining. And I will always very much... um, be grateful for that, because I remember that as a young child, uh, <laughs> I was really naughty, okay? And whatever it was, I don't know why, but whatever your parents tell you not to do, uh, and then you sneak around and, and do those things that they said not to do. Uh, I remember specifically that when we went up to school, for some reason, we just thought it was like a really super fun thing to get up on the roof and run around the roofs at school. And then at home, I ended up doing the same thing, too. I found a way to get up on the roof, okay? And my dad told me, don't be going up on the roofs, you know, because someone saw us there at school or whatever. I got in trouble for that. Well, you know what? It was, and he was at work, you know, and mom's doing what she's doing in the house. There I was up on the roof again, okay? Uh, and there were the times I got caught, and I got disciplined, and I got spanked and it was no fun I was angry I was upset at first it's like ah but you know what there are those times that you're doing things and they don't know you don't get caught so kind of keep that in mind I keep that in mind like if you're gonna get pulled over by the cop and and doesn't the same thing happen you're oh man I didn't it didn't really you know you're trying to defend yourself and stuff like that but I try to think to myself you know what how many times did I do things I wasn't supposed to And uh, I didn't get busted, okay? I didn't get caught. So there were the times I didn't get caught. And uh, I really had guilt. I had guilt because of the times I didn't get caught. And I felt like a really bad kid. And I would say, well, you know, I was very terrified of death. And I'd say, well, you know, am I going to go to heaven? Oh, yeah, you're a good little boy. No problem. You know, you're going to go to heaven. But I felt really rotten. I felt really bad. And I didn't want to die because I was concerned about what was going to happen. And that's what the Lord used in my heart and in my life that when I first heard the gospel when I was nine years old, I repented of my sin and came to know the Lord. But as fathers, we would discipline our children as best that we know how. But that's the heart of the Father. And that's the heart that he has for us also as his children and as believers, that he's going to discipline us um, for our own good. And in uh, verse... Seven, I think it is where I left off. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Now, my background was very different from my wife's. She came out of a pagan and spiritual dark sort of stuff to be saved and became a believer. And then within a short time, she was married to me. And then after three months, we were pregnant with our first one, which we didn't plan it that way, but now we're having a family. So her idea was that the children would just be so grateful to be born into a Christian family and be really wonderful, great Christian kids from, you know, small. Um, But... Both of our children uh, rebelled at a, at a young age. My daughter, very young, I think it was 10, either 10 or 11. Uh, and that just grieved her heart to no end. And she just couldn't believe it, um, that they would do that. I do. I understand that. But see, I'm coming where I'm coming from. She's coming where she's coming from. So she took it personally because she was raising them at, her, at home and pouring all her you know, heart into them. Um, But when it came to Rusty, it was just really, really bad and discouraging. He was uh, older, though. He was 16 years old, and he was disappearing. We don't know where he is, not coming home till really late, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, 1 or 2 o'clock at night. There was 
things that were going on when, when I wasn't there because I was working in ministry and a lot of time I wasn't there and she was having to deal with things that I would only know by being told. And so we came to a point where we're going to have to deal with this. And for a time, Yolanda went to go live with some friends with ours. And so he knew that. He was nine years old at the time that happened. And so he knew that if it gets to a certain point and you're just totally rebellious against our rules of the home, that you're not going to be in the home. So he had already seen that. So what happened is when we had to deal with him uh, over these issues that he was involved with, it's kind of like at work where you're going to get fired and you say, oh, you're not firing me, I quit. You know, So that's kind of the way he was. He had it all planned out, and, and he says, nope, you're not kicking me out, I'm leaving. So he had it all planned out with his best buddy, and he was going to go over and li- to live with him. And so uh, what happened is I ended up speaking, uh, not, not with his father and mother, but they were both in agreement. I spoke with the father, and I said, well, look, this is the situation here, and what's going on with us? Do you, do you really want to do that? you want to take on that responsibility? And uh, the father's friend said, yeah, it's perfectly fine with me if he lives here, so... We, we knew he wasn't out on the street. He had somewhere to live, but he left home. And so we were really grieved over the situation. And, and, and in our hearts, we knew he was just a very wild person and was involved in very dangerous stuff. And for all that we knew, we were never going to see our son again. You know? And then other people would just didn't understand. They, they thought, well, what? How could you let that happen? How, how could you not go get him back? How could you not do this? How can you not do that? And um, we had got counsel. We asked questions. We were told, well, you need to send him to this reform place. Uh, it was supposed to be Christian, and they were just going to really, really, uh, you know, beat the tar out of you and, and, and you know, and, and force you to be good and stuff like that. And I thought, oh, well, no, that's not going to work with Rusty. I know that for sure. We prayed about it. We asked for wisdom and understanding. And that's what I would say for the young fathers now is, boy, in this world we're living in now, just pray for wisdom and understanding because we can't just give an answer like, oh, that's a situation like this and that. Oh, this is exactly what you should do. You, you can get counsel, and that's a good thing. You can look in God's word, but you really need to earnestly pray to, to the Lord, Lord, give me wisdom and understanding. And, and although people didn't think we were doing the right thing, we, we felt that we were doing what the Lord was leading us to do. And some time it went by, I think it was at least a, a year or more, a year, year and a half, and then all of a sudden our... our our son is at our doorstep. Oh, whoa, really? I didn't expect it. Just out of nowhere because we didn't see him in the time in between. And he came in, and he was just very broken. He's a very broken person, and he was just crying. And uh, what happened is he's in high school, and his 13-year-old girlfriend is pregnant. Um, and in his mind, he really thought that we would have the attitude, well, see, this is what happens. We told you so. You need to go take care of that. But, but, but we didn't. We were grieved. We could see his heart. And uh, we just prayed with him. And, uh, and we told him, you can come back home to live with us if you're willing to respect you know, the rules of the home. And we'll be supportive of you and of your girlfriend. And we'll do everything we can to help you out to be able to have your child. And um, later on, what Rusty had told us which was very helpful to, to us and to me as a father, is he said, you know what, Dad? Some people are just that way. I'm that way. There's nothing your mom could have ever done or said or that anybody could have done. Nothing. Some people just have to get down to the bottom and experience these terrible things in their life before they're going to be humbled and repent and come back to the Lord. So my son told me that. And so it was a very difficult thing to do to um, you know, kick our son out of the house and so forth. And others didn't think that was the right thing to do, but it worked out for the best. And as all we could do at the time is ask, Lord, please give us wisdom and understanding about what to do. So uh, my wife and I actually had uh, experienced that for ourselves with our own prodigal son. Um, and so I would just like to close uh, in prayer and think about that Jesus taught us to pray uh, within this manner, as he gave an example, he said, Our Father which art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We need to be gracious to others. And deliver us from evil, for thou, 
of the kingdom and glory forever. So let's just close in prayer now. Be thankful to our Father. Lord, I just thank you. So you have the heart of the Father, and you know and you understand all that you've been through. You created the family. You created the father. You created the mother. That's your design for us to understand you as being fathers and knowing what it's like to be grieved in the heart. We read the Old Testament and all the things that happened there and how your heart was grieved over your people rebelling against you and that we can keep that in mind and whatever we're dealing with with our children and things that happen along that line if they're being rebellious or if they don't want to repent or to receive the Lord as Savior, that we can be gracious and long-suffering and look to your example and ask for wisdom and understanding in these things and that you would show us, especially in this time that we're living in now, with the cell phone and all the ways that these things can get to our children that it's impossible for us to always be there and to protect them and keep it away from them. And for our grandchildren, for myself, I'm thinking about my grandchildren. It has to be in their heart and their decision that they don't want these things. They need to come to you and they need to make that choice and that decision themselves is all that we can do is the best we can do and to pray for them. So I just want to thank you, Lord, for your love and your graciousness and understanding Toward us in Jesus' name. Amen.